Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Edward Papakwabna Kwache. I'm a nephrologist and senior lecturer with the University of Ghana Medical School. Today I'll be hosting our episode of the Glomcon Emerging Therapeutics Educational Series, and we have a distinguished guest in the person of Dr. Rashid Badigasin to speak to us about apolipoprotein L1 mediated kidney diseases. Dr. Rashid Badigasin is the Wilbur Davidson Distinguished Professor of Pediatric Nephrology in the Division of Pediatrics, Duke University, University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. He's a practicing pediatric nephrologist and a physician scientist. His current research focuses on understanding the molecular pathogenesis of nephrotic syndrome and in understanding the bi biologic basics for health disparity in nephrotic syndrome and other glomerular diseases. So we're quite pleased to have you today. Thanks so much and thanks for having me. So considering the growing burden of kidney disease globally, how significant do you think the role of apolipoprotein L1 mediated kidney disease in terms of the high risk apolipoprotein L1 phenotype is to this impact? Thank you so much. And that's a very interesting question and a very important question. So the discovery of variant in April one gene as a risk factor for CKD in people of African ancestry showed us clearly that in addition to disparity in access to healthcare, racism and other social and environmental factors, there are biologic and genetic explanation for the high incidence and prevalence of CKD in people of African ancestry. And uh, based on what we know about April 1 now, April 1 is probably the major driver. However, there are other risk factors out there that we are going to discover in future um, with advanced um, research, especially applying all the great tools of our genomic studies. Thank you very much. And it's quite interesting the points you made that it's early days yet, and we still need to do a lot of work, look further into the exact effects of this high-risk genotype in the at-risk population, which is generally people of African ancestry or Africans and African Americans. But even from the early work that's been done, it's quite striking and interesting to know that considering the kidney conditions that have been found to worsen in individuals with the high-risk APY protein L1 risk um, gene, Comparing African Americans to Africans or West Africans, where the gene pool for this high risk genotype is supposed to be of the highest prevalence, the odds of actually developing worsening kidney function or apolipoprotein associated mediated kidney disease are much higher in people of African American ancestry as compared to West Africans and Africans. What do you think could be accounting for this in your opinion? Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting question. So um, the first thing is, uh, like I said in my first response, eh, it is still early days, eh? believe it or not. I know that we are marking, we've marked the 10th anniversary of you know April 1 discovery. However, um, we are still, we still have a lot of work to do. So the very first thing is that we do not have uh, very large and robust data from Africa yet. So we have to interpret the data about uh, severity of disease and disease progression carefully. However, if the pattern that we have out now is sustained, that is that African-Americans tend to progress rapidly than Africans living in Africa, uh, one possible explanation will actually be the high mortality associated with chronic kidney disease in uh, West Africans that are living in Africa, in West Africa, because of limited access to kidney replacement therapy. So what exactly do I mean by this? So it's quite possible that what we are seeing is actually an artifact of excess mortality in Africans living in Africa. So if you, I think the most severe manifestation of a disease is actually uh, mortality. So if uh, you have high mortality from CKD on the continent, and really it's very difficult to um, compare the, the severity of disease because 
people that are presumably much more severely affected in Africa because they do not have access to renal replacement therapy would have given up um, and they would be missing from the data that is actually looking at CKD severity. So that's one explanation. The second thing is that uh, we also have to look at the role of modifier genes. And so African in diaspora, we definitely have um, admixed you know, genome now. So quite unlike um, Africans living in Africa. So the role of modifier genes will be very important. And I would expect that to actually be different between Africans living in Africa and um, Africans in diaspora. And then of course, we have to also we, are, we also have to consider the effect of um, environmental disease modifiers. And this is particularly important for April 1 because we know that inflammasome, inflammasome and cytokine, um, cytokine response plays a very important role in disease pathogenesis in April 1. So you are talking about a continent, so I'm talking about Africa now, where individuals are actually exposed to constant antigenic challenge. So you will expect the response to the disease or the disease cause to be different um, between Africans living in Western countries and Africans living in Africa. Does that answer your question? It truly does. And this is these are really intriguing thoughts. While we're still on that topic, I, I'd be interested to know, at this point, even though it's 10 years on, but still reasonably early in our journey with apolipoprotein L1 high-risk genes. Would you advocate for routine screening in at-risk populations for apolipoprotein L1 high-risk genes? Would you recommend this to be part of clinical care going forward? And if so, what challenges do you anticipate? Very, very important uh, question. And there are so many things that we have to take into consideration in um in you know looking at this subject so the first thing is there is no doubt about it that we have to consider strongly the resources that are available and how we are going to use the resources judiciously and using the the resources judiciously means when we are ordering a test we need to ask uh, three fundamental questions that i ask myself when I'm ordering any diagnostic test. So be it urinalysis, be it kidney ultrasound, be it a renal function panel. I usually ask myself three fundamental questions. The first one is the test that I'm ordering, is it likely going to help in making firm diagnosis or change my clinical diagnosis? So that's number one. The second one is, is the test likely to change the current treatment plans that I have? So I'm seeing a patient with a proteinuria and I'm seeing a patient with nephrotic ring proteinuria. All that I have the patient on is his inhibitor. Now, are there other things that are available out there that I can use? And uh, will this diagnostic test actually inform my choice of those agents? So that's the second important question. Is the test likely to change the current treatment plans? The third one is uh, that, is the test likely to inform prognosis? Will I be able to talk confidently to the patient and say that, look, based on the result of this test, I expect your kidney function to stay stable for the next 10 years. I expect your kidney function to start deteriorating in the next five years. And believe it or not, all these um, questions uh, are very important for, uh, for patients. Although when they come to us, they do not ask us directly, but these are the kind of information that they expect from us. So based on these three questions, uh, the way in which I look at diagnostic tests is that if the answer to one or more of this question is yes, then there is a strong rationale for me for ordering the test. So based on this and based on what we know about APOL1 um, mediated kidney disease so far, I will say yes. However, the yes will be more emphatic once we understand better the reasons why some people will develop AMKD, uh, that's April 1 mediated kidney disease, and others will not, despite the fact that they are carrying the iris genotype. Also, 
the picture will become clearer once we have therapy that is approved for clinical use. So when I say therapy approved for clinical use, therapy that we can, um, you know, compounds that we can use for treatment or compounds that we can actually use for preventing progression of disease. Thank you very much. On that score, I'd be quite interested to know what your thoughts are on some of the current breakthroughs that have been made in terms of treatments for apolipoprotein L1 mediated kidney disease on top of standard or supportive care. There have been recent publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, for instance, pointing to some promising drugs. Would you be kind enough to walk us through your thoughts on some of these drugs yeah, or yeah. drug intervention? Yeah. So, Ed, so uh, I will start answering that question by saying that this is um, the most exciting time eh, to actually be a pediatric nephrologist. Why did I say that? So, I have been practicing pediatric nephrology for more than two decades now and in fact people that have been practicing nephrology for the past five to six decades um we when was the last time that we they actually got you know medication into trial most likely the last one was probably you know ace inhibitor or harp now we are in 2023 now and all of a sudden in the last two to three years we actually have multiple medications in clinical trial. Not only are they in clinical trial, they're actually very, very promising that they're likely to uh, make changes to the life of people who are living with chronic kidney disease. So let me be more specific with uh, compounds targeting APOL1 now. Now, the I think the fundamental principle, one of the big paper that uh, was published that actually threw light on how we should um, on how we should approach using the genomic information that we have to inform therapeutic search for uh, April one mediated kidney disease was the findings I believe is a report from a family in India published many years ago that individuals who do not have copies of April one gene are alive without any obvious disease. So because of that, um, the, the implication of that is that uh, there is some degree of functional you know, redundancy for this gene. So because of that, it is possible to actually silence this gene, okay? So um, it is therefore uh, not surprising that uh, the approach for the three agents that I'm aware of that are in clinical trials, and trust me, more are coming. Are one, we can silence the gene through antisense oligonucleotides. So that's one approach. The second thing is that we can actually devise small molecules that can target the cytotoxic, cytotoxic effects of the APOL1 high-risk um, variants. So that's the G1 and the G2 variants. And three, inhibitors of a pathway called JAXTA pathway and other blockers of inflammatory pathways related to APOL1 variants. Based on what is known about disease mechanisms so far, all these approach are justified and reasonable. However, clinical trials should be carried out in diverse populations and regions of the world to put in proper perspective the efficacy of these agents and also to document, this is very important, and also to document carefully the potential side effects of these agents. And I think I've alluded to this when um, you asked me the question about severity between Africans in dias diaspora and Africans in Africa. The environment situation is different. The modified genes is different. So there is, so for any agents to be able to say, to, for, any, for any agents to be approved and, you know, for this condition, studies have to be carried out both in Western countries and Africa. So that's very, very important. And so this is, uh, so to be honest with you, the discovery of um, April 1 CKD variants is uh, very, very exciting because in less than 10 years, we're actually talking about uh, different classes of medication that we can actually use to treat this condition. And this clearly demonstrates the power of genomics in drug discoveries. Thank you so much, Dr. Badi-Gerson. 
truly important, the point you emphasized about ensuring that there's diversity in these trials to ensure that as many people as will benefit from these interventions subsequently do actually inter um, get exposure to the clinical trials and ultimately benefit from the findings thereof. It's been really great speaking to you, very enlightening and insightful. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you everyone for listening to our interview. Have a nice thank day. Thank you so much eh, for, for having me. So I must say that uh, the future is bright, but there's still a lot of work to do. And um, the it's like we should actually just convert this to a movement, people that are actually very enthusiastic for nipping chronic kidney disease in the board. And I am very upbeat and I'm very, very optimistic that we are moving in the right direction. And thank you so much eh, for asking me to be part of this eh? and all the best with your program.